And now to lead the session on renewable energy, would like to invite Mr. David Doherty from Bloomberg, who will be the moderator. Therefore, without further ado, let's welcome together Mr. David Doherty. Hi, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Um, hello, everybody. Um, like they've said, they've actually stolen my line, but Imperial College and the International Energy Agency earlier this year said that uh, renewable power de development in the region is behind all other regions, and they cited scalable investment policies, but most crucially, attracting low-cost financing as a major hurdle. So the panel that are with me today are hopefully going to pick this apart a little bit, and we're going to discuss some of the opportunities as well as some of the challenges. So. Let's introduce the panel. Um, Dajuk Vera Aram Abdul Rahim, Chief Executive Officer, Malaysia Investment Development Authority. Uh, Nian Antoine, Deputy Director General, Foreign Investment Agency, Ministry of Planning and Investment, for Vietnam. Mr. Ferdas Abdul Qadir, Senior Manager and Head of Facilitation and Coordination Office, FAST, at the Brunei Economic Development Board. Raquel Ashag, Director, Board of Investments, the Philippines. Mr. Kamen Palatov, Director and Chief Portfolio Officer at Indica Energy. Hi, nice to meet you. And finally, yes, a panel of six. Exciting, right? Um, Dushan Tucker, Deputy Energy Director at WIPA. Hi. Wonderful. Please uh, take a seat, everybody. Now, we heard that sort of not glorious review of the renewable energy market in, in Southeast Asia and in the ASEAN region. And over the next hour or so, or 40 minutes as it now is, uh, we're going to discuss this with our panelists. Um, if we have time at the end, we will open for audience questions. And you've been a bit quiet to date, so please speak up if we do get to that stage. Um, but I want to start with some success stories, please. Um, so, Mr. Nguyen from Vietnam. Uh, Vietnam has the most success in terms of attracting investment into renewables to date. 2020 saw a boom in solar investment. But as soon as feed-in tariffs stopped in Vietnam, so too did investment flow. Um, since then, we've seen grid constraints limiting the solar story in Vietnam. So help us here. What led investment and what learnings have you taken from that era? And do you think that there are some changes that could be made to bring it back to being competitive again? Okay, uh, thank you very much uh, for the uh, question. Uh, uh, frankly saying that uh, the uh, solar market uh, and the renewable uh, energy is uh, uh, very potential, uh, especially for uh, the uh, country like Vietnam. Uh, and until now, uh, we are uh, is uh, one of uh, some country uh, very attractive to the uh, foreign investor in the sector of uh, renewable energy. Um, because uh, we have a very big uh, potential. And uh, you see that Vietnam is a uh, very cross uh, country with the long coastal line. So uh, uh, we have a uh, great potential to uh, develop the uh, renewable, especially the uh, solar or windy, offshore windy uh, electricity. And uh, that's why uh, now we are receiving uh, many uh, potential for investors coming to find the opportunity to develop that uh, potential sector. And uh, at the beginning of developing that solar uh, electric, uh, solar power, um, the government uh, have given um, many policy to support uh, the foreign investment uh, to, to do in uh, uh, renewable energy by uh, giving them the uh, FIT, FIT uh, price uh, system, but uh, uh, when the investment in that sector uh, meet the limit, 
So uh, uh, I think that uh, is the time uh, that we stop that uh, uh, price system and change to uh, another suitable system. Um, and uh, now you can see uh, in the um, um, energy uh, global market that the price for the uh, renewable uh, energy is uh, uh, decreasing very positively because uh, the uh, improve of the new technology for uh, that energy so that uh, now uh, Vietnamese government is uh, changing uh, the uh, the price system uh, that uh, to be suitable and approaching to the uh, market um, that uh, we uh, make the uh, we create the uh, price frame um, approved by the uh, Ministry of uh, Industry and Trade and then we let the uh, foreign investors to uh, negotiate negotiate with the uh, uh, the, the uh, we call EVN, Electricity of Vietnam, to negotiate about the suitable price under the uh, price frame uh, approved by the uh, Ministry of uh, Industry and Trade. And uh, we also uh, improving the um, legal framework. Uh, for example, uh, we are improving and uh, amending the law on electricity and uh, we, uh, the Prime Minister of Vietnam has just approved the uh, PDP-8. We call PDP-8 is the uh, power uh, national plan uh, and it can uh, restructure the, uh, the, the, the energy uh, resources in Vietnam uh, toward the year of 2030 uh, so that the percentage of renewable uh, energy increased. Uh, we have the target to uh, to, to increase the percentage of using um, renewable energy uh, to what about 12% uh, to uh, 2030 and uh, get uh, about 40% by 2050. And uh, it can uh, make the balance between renewable energy and others. And uh, that's some experience that I can share uh, uh, with other uh, member country about uh, the practice of Vietnam. Thank you. Yeah, competitive pricing seems to be sort of a commonality in themes. Um, Dato Quira, if I could go to you, we saw in Vietnam the direct purchasing price agreement just recently launched. Um, and Malaysia has done some similar things themselves, but it is amongst the most advantages in the reason in terms of long-term debt market depth, developing banking sector, lots of experience funding really large projects. Um, but with an incoming utility dominating the market, it has not really attracted a proportionate level of investment in the renewable sector to date. Um, your recent corporate green power program, however, is trying to change that. And this allows private off-takers via virtual PPAs. Uh, do you think this is going to work? Do you think you'll do more programs like this? And importantly, do you think you'll see more private capital coming into the Malaysian market off the back of this? Thank you, David, for the question. Yeah. Before I respond directly to your question on the corporate green power uh, program, let me put into the perspective in the case of Malaysia when it comes to the renewable energy. So uh, recently we have uh, updated our national determined contribution under the Paris Agreement where we pledge to reduce our economic wide carbon intensity against GDP by 45% in 2030. So therefore, uh, we have started our journey uh, towards renewable energy uh, for the last many years and we have implemented a number of initiatives such as the feed-in tariff, uh, self-consumption, uh, we also implemented net energy metering as well as the large-scale solar uh, plants throughout the country. So by 2022, the installed capacity, mixed capacity, by 2022, this initiative already reached 22% of our total energy capacity. So back to your question on the recent uh, introduction by the government of Malaysia, uh, when it come to the corporate green power program, uh, this was launched sometime November last year and since November until May, uh, 
uh, we have uh, put in place all the guidelines and as well as the, you know, how the process, the application and so on. So starting from May this year until December, what we target under this corporate uh, green power program, uh, that by 2050, there will be about uh, 800 megawatt. So, so far since the launch of this, we have 22 bidders, 22 companies, be in the form of individual as well as consortium. So now, uh, based from these 22 uh, business uh, investors, uh, 560 megawatt has been taken up from that 800. So what I'm trying to say here that, based from this program, this is a very successful program because it benefits many parties, including the national electricity company, the corporate, the investment, the investors, as well as the solar power companies who have produced the solar that work into the grid. So based from the success story of this, which remaining 260 megawatt that is available for investors to come and invest in this renewable energy under the program of the corporate power, I mean the corporate green power program, I can see that uh, there will be more pro uh, program as such to be introduced by the government in Malaysia. As shared by our minister today, Minister of Investment, Tengku Zafro, recently we already launched our energy transformation, our transition roadmap, as well as last, uh, yesterday we introduced our National Industrial Master Plan, where ESG, sustainability goals, has been given emphasis uh, you know, on where Malaysia would like to bring when it comes to renewable energy. As you might aware, Malaysia is a host of more than 5,000 multinational companies where when they invested in Malaysia, they are also moving towards uh, uh, utilizing renewable energy for their process because many of them are exporting back to EU and many other countries where Renewable energy has been given one of the option, one of the condition for them to send back their product into that country. Similarly, uh, to support the multinational company, uh, our Malaysian company, domestic company has to be part of the supply chain of this multinational company. They are also have to utilize renewable energy. So therefore, uh, I would like to summarize that this uh, program under the corporate green uh, power program is a very successful model and therefore because of these two uh, plans that we have introduced recently the energy transition roadmap as well as the not new industry master plan there will be a lot of opportunity both in, for foreign direct investment as domestic investment is renewable energy so that is my take on your question yeah, thank so you optimism yeah. a lot of opportunity in integrating the value chain um, there are a lot of plans coming out of the, of the region in terms of um, trying to spur investment and encourage excitement. Uh, Ms. Raquel, I'd love to go to you for the next question. Um, not long ago, the Philippines you know, amended their Renewable Energy Act, so it would allow 100% foreign ownership of renewable energy products, projects even. Um, with the World Bank, the Ministry of Energy outlined an, an offshore wind roadmap, and um, competitive auctions are in place. There's a national renewable energy plan in place with pretty ambitious targets. All of these things look really exciting for the Philippines market. Um, is it about to come the, the market to watch in terms of wind and solar investments? And I ask that because so far we've only really seen indications of interest in projects and, and not really firm commitments or investments just yet. So how do we get it from indications of, oh, I might be interested too, here's my money. Yeah. Thank you, David. Yeah, actually, uh, it, uh, the IRR or of, of rules and regulations to liberalize, uh, that liberalized uh, foreign investments in RE uh, investments was only uh, enacted in uh, November 2022. But however, uh, in January, we already uh, approved a total of 400 billion peso, around 7 billion US dollars in offshore wind project, 100% foreign owned. So that's barely uh, two months from liberalizing the foreign investments uh, for uh, at least for the solar and wind uh, energy projects. So there are a lot of uh, interest from foreign investors to come in 
in offshore wind at least, and uh, some projects for solar. So right now, uh, we at the Philippine Board of Investments, we have received a total of 22 projects, which we are uh, uh, evaluating. Most of them are from uh, foreign investors. So at least I can say that the liberalization of the uh, 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 acceptance of foreign investments in RE for solar and wind is a, a, very, a very good move from the government. Thank you. And are these investors multilateral banks, international banks? Are they energy companies? Who, who is interested? Who's, who's showing interest so far? It's a mix. Uh, uh, there are uh, foreign uh, energy companies okay. interested. In it. And some of our projects that have been registered before that are 100% Filipino owned, they are uh, actually uh, having partners now to at least uh, have a more than 50% uh, of the foreign equity in those projects. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Ferdas, I'll go to you next. Um, like we heard, there's interest from foreign energy companies, which is great. I would guess there's an oil barrel or two behind that money. Um, most financing in the region, however, does come from non-private sources. Um, there's regulatory and financial market frameworks um, that are cited really as limiting appetite for private investors so far. What can policymakers do in the region to enhance the role of private finance or blended finance or development financial, any kind of finance that's non-governmental? Um, and how do you think this will help to uh, speed up the renewable deployment story in the region? Okay, thank you very much, David, for setting the scene. And I also think that we should also say thanks to the, both MCs for providing the, the, the scene setting as well. It was as somber and as a underwhelming introduction to renewables <laughs> that I have, you know, uh, come across. But I think this is an opportunity for us to recalibrate and uh, I guess uh, realign how we think uh, and gauge uh, the appetite is among private investors, uh, DFIs, private funds, equity, uh, all financial institutions towards the renewable energy prospects in Southeast Asia. Coming from the Brunei Economic Development Board, as also coming from a small country where our renewable energy industry is relatively nascent and where the business ecosystem and the environment in terms of the sectoral policies, in terms of the uh, incentive structures, etc., are still work in progress. Nonetheless, we still receive quite decent, uh, significant interest from investors uh, coming to us, uh, knocking on our doors, uh, proposing to pursue renewable energy projects in Brunei. And so investor interest uh, in Brunei, uh, renewable energy, is such that for the private sector to, uh, to bid for. Now, second suggestion that I would like to make is that, the, you know, uh, in line with all these national plans, the policymakers need to create conducive conditions for investors, uh, for private investors to, to come in. Like in any sector, and now, especially in renewable, at the core of the financing is the question of risk. Who is taking uh, risk uh, uh, up front, uh, private sector or, or the government? And so it is well and good. So, so it is well and good that uh, so we have all these structures, but really investors need certainty and investors need to have clarity on what they are investing in. And so what is important is to have policies that, are, uh, that will incentivize renewable energy investments such as tax credits, uh, subsidies, feed-in tariffs, etc. But what's really important for all these policies is that they need to be clear and they need to be predictable. I think one way, uh, one structure that no, most uh, countries that successfully have implemented these things uh, in the form of long-term power purchase agreements, PPAs. And that's one model that I think has been adapted by a few of my colleagues here uh, around, uh, sorry, uh, around, the, around the table. Um, perhaps a last point I'd like to make in terms of what policymakers can do to improve it is to improve and streamline the regulatory process. It's all these simplifying the, the project approval process every step of the way. So, you know, from the project inception, the design, the fundraising, the EIA process, construction, and, and so on. It will be very helpful to have a one-stop agency that, that can t 
take care of the investor, and that is the own that is the only agency that is in in uh, co in contact that that there is someone that can be the relationship manager for 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 the for the investor, and so I think I, I like to end there. Of course, plenty more that we can uh, talk about yeah, in terms of getting policy. Uh, one stop better. shop to simplify it. I'm sure it would be um, on the top of the wish list for many developers. Um, Mr. Dushan, sorry you're so far away from me. I hope you can hear me. Um, we, we heard just there about some of the risk profiles that pro, uh, private investors are, are really willing to take. Um, transparency around project level performance, robust frameworks for renewable investments, access to hedging tools, things for credit and currency uh, hedging, for example. These are all amongst the challenges facing a private investor in, in this region. Um, but they're also part of the core objectives of your organization. Can you tell us a little bit about the learnings that you've, you've made to date and, and some of the real challenges that you still see that the region as a whole needs to tackle in order to, to speed this up? Thank you so much. I hope I'm audible. Yes, sorry. Uh, one little clarification. Uh, my designation is Deputy Executive Director and not the Deputy Energy Director, just to sort of clarify that I'm not an energy expert here. But uh, I, I did, you know, pull out five specific points which I thought would be very useful for the region. And, and I'll try and, you know, talk about points which complement, you know, some of the points which were just talked about. So my first point was essentially that investors love countries that have long-term stable policies, you know. And I did want to pu pull out, you know, that example from South America, uh, from Latin America, Chile, which today is a leader in renewable energy. And now, you know, renewables actually dominates the, the, the energy sector in that country. And there are a, a number of examples, you know, which demonstrate how, you know, this uh, long-term stable policies have come in. But just three quick points, you know, uh, as was talked about, regular rene renewable energy auctions are taking place, which provide, you know, long-term PPAs. So that's one. Second, they have a renewable portfolio standard in place since 2008. Now, that's something which requires electricity providers to source a certain percentage from RE. It's the second point. And third is that they had introduced net billing and net metering policies. This, just few examples from Chile, but clearly, you know, they're a leader in this space. Uh, the second example which I want to talk about was, again, incentives. And now, I know this is something which has already been talked a lot about here. But incentives can be vital, uh, especially when you're really talking about opening up to the RE sector. And I did want to, you know, uh, talk about India. Uh, you know, when we really see, and, and these guys today, they have 67 gigawatts in solar. And it's all happened very quickly. Let's go out and see what is it that they did, you know. And this, this story of theirs can be quickly broken down into four phases. The first phase was very clearly that investors are not going to come in. You know, it's too expensive. A viability gap funding of 40% was brought in. You know, that started a little bit of action happening, but, but just a little bit, you know, even with the 40% viability gap funding. The second phase is where, you know, it was actually really creating, a, you know, an ecosystem which enabled investments, you know. And they knew that, you know, they can't just depend on a few existing energy players, but they said, what if we can get the largest conglomerates in our country you know, to also go in and put their money into RE, you know. So they did a few things, but then the, the largest names in India, be it a Reliance, be it an Adani or the Tatas, all of these guys put money into solar, you know, into renewable energy. And they had actually uh, done, again, incentives, affordable, uh, you know, financing options, trunk infrastructure, solar parks. The third phase is where, you know, once all these big players and a new few new players were there, <clears throat> the financial investors follow. Institutional investors, they, you know, came like bees would come to a flower, you know. So that was like the flow. Each and every project in the country, in India, is actually in the public-private format. And investors have invested in each RE project in the country. The fourth phase, and that's where, you know, they just sort of, there now, is where they are 
seeing the dependence on maybe one or two other countries for their solar panels. Again, the game goes back to incentives. So they have come out with something called as the production linked incentive scheme. Something very interesting, but that's something which is actually getting manufacturing to sort of take in place. So that was the second example of how incentives can be very important. The third example, again, we've talked a little bit about projects. Bankable projects are important. You know, financial investors would come and they will say, we have the money, but where are the projects? And what does it actually make them bankable? Give the land already, get all the clearances in place, get the single windows in place. But if you have beautiful projects, investors come in for that. A couple of quick examples, Morocco, you know, the Noor uh, solar complex, Chile, Serra Dominador uh, solar plant, Egypt, Benman solar park. All of these projects, a lot of homework was done before these projects were actually put out in front of investors. My fourth point, innovation entrepreneurship is very important. You know, if you really want to get the ball rolling, the startups have to be there. You know, so there are countries which have actually come out with some very innovative stuff as far as renewable energy startup ecosystems are concerned. Germany has what is called as a startup energy transition program or a SET program. Australia has a clean energy seed fund. Now, we as WIPA have been working with the International Solar Alliance for a SolarX grand challenge in Africa. 180 applications, 20 winners from across Africa. You know, it's beautiful the way those case studies are coming out and a lot of this action is now moving to, uh, you know, Asia Pacific is how we see it. My last point, investment promotion agencies. I represent the World Association of Investment Promotion Agencies. You know, the IPAs, BKPM, you know, Board of Investment, Thailand, Philippines, all of these are very powerful agencies. Get them in the center stage. You know, make them a bigger part of all of this investment action which is taking place. Be it investable projects, you know. It should not be more of a Ministry of Energy or somebody. It has to be the, the investment agency and them together, you know. So IPAs can really bring in that difference. Uh, I'll just stop here, but, uh, you know, uh, I think all of these learnings applied to the region can actually make a huge difference. And we as Viper look forward to, you know, working individually with each of the countries and collectively with all of you. I'll just stop there. Thank you. Um, it's always good to have some good examples, like Chile and Morocco. And there's also bad examples as the benefit of maybe being a little bit later to the party than others. You can learn from the mistakes of others. Um, Mr. Common, sorry for leaving you there. Hi, you're also far away. Um, Nature-based solutions, they get far less attention than things like wind and solar, right? Everybody knows what a wind panel looks like, or, um, a solar panel or a wind blade looks like, even geothermal, for example. Um, I have two parts of a question for you. First is, what are some of the impediments for their development at the moment? And then the second part of the question would be, you know, we heard before in the, in the EV panel that Indonesia is really well placed in terms of um, minerals, for example, and inputs into the supply chain. It's also really well positioned in terms of nature-based solutions. Is that going to be a domestic benefit? Is that going to be something that's packaged and sold abroad? Will we see people coming in and packaging offsets, for example, as part of their oil or gas portfolio? Um, so, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for having me, and thank you for bringing up a relatively less covered topic. Um, so before I talk about the impediments yeah, and some of the opportunities, I'd like to share what we as investors see as opportunities in sort of nature-related investments. Uh, and when we look at that, there is essentially sort of four things that we assess. Does it create positive impact to nature? Does it create positive impact to the climate? Positive impact to the communities, uh, people in the area and so forth? And then, of course, positive impact for our pockets as investors, right? So all of these four things have to work for these projects to, to be successful. And there are three specific areas that we find very attractive in Indonesia, but I think very relevant to the area because of similar climatic conditions. One is in the area of biomass production, specifically uh, producing wood chips, wood pellets as replacement for coal in the energy industry. Uh, for heating and for power generation, where the sort of the, the, the footprint in terms of carbon is, is much, much lower than burning coal. Uh, we also see opportunities from biomass in producing alternative fuels. 
particularly from waste products like uh, palm oil production, pome, uh, waste cooking oil. There is ways to use that to produce fuels, particularly uh, sustainable aviation fuel and sustainable diesel. So that's one area that I think is very relevant uh, and, and there's a lot of opportunities for success in the region. Uh, the second one is what we call agroforestry. Um, so this is essentially working with local communities in a few key um, sort of ingredients or, or fruit or nuts, so to say, such as cocoa, coffee, uh, and, and some materials for production of essential oils, such as patchouli, nutmeg, and so forth. Um, so we, we see that sort of the value chain in this segment, a lot of the value historically has been concentrated in the downstream, right? And I know earlier today it was spoken about downstreaming a lot of, uh, there's a lot of opportunities downstream in Indonesia. But this, I think, is one opportunity where you can actually upstream and create more value in the upstream, working with farmers, local communities, improving yields, uh, actually having the opportunity to uh, preserve some land and even do agriculture in wild forests. You can actually grow wild coffee. And, and these are all products that are very well received by multinational food companies that have set targets and standards and are willing to pay premium for products that are produced in a sustainable way. So we think that's another area of, uh, for exciting investments. Uh, the third one is sort of what we call carbon, right? Um, preserving, um, and, and let, me, let me give you some numbers. Indonesia has more than 19 million, 19, 90 million hectares of forest land. Uh, about half of that is pristine forest in provinces like Papua, Aceh, Kalimantan and so forth. There's more than 20 million hectares of peatland. That's more than 30% of the global. Um, so th this is prime area and, and, I'm, and I assume similar in countries like Malaysia and Vietnam, given the, uh, the, the availability of forests and similar climate conditions to, uh, to look for, create, and then manage carbon capture projects uh, preservation projects or restoration of peatland projects where uh, potentially investors can recover uh, their investment in the form of carbon credits, right? And, and there is a huge opportunity in this region that we believe is exciting for us as investors. Now, impediments. Financing is always an impediment and a challenge. This topic is relatively new, so a lot of people do not fully know what this is all about. Right? So, so getting regulators educated, getting communities educated, um, that, that is an investment that's required in order to succeed in, 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 the, in this area. Um, and of course then support in the form of tax, uh, more clear regulations, because it's, it's all relatively new, right? Um, so, so to us, that's the impediment, uh, and it takes a lot of effort uh, in, in dealing with multiple stakeholders to try to align uh, to ensure that you, know, you get the project approved or you get the right sort of framework to support it uh, and so forth. So these are some of the impediments. And, and just lastly, as I said, so I think not, not, this is not only relevant to Indonesia where my experience is from, but I think clearly there will be opportunities in countries like Cambodia, in Laos, in Vietnam, to work with farmers and local communities, both in terms of sustainable agriculture, but also preserving peatlands and forests and, and so forth, and also in the biomass sector. So that's what I wanted to share uh, to the audience today. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, huge market. We're seeing lots of activity in Guyana and Brazil. I mean, the list goes on Canada uh, in terms of this, um, an emerging market in itself. We have got time for a question from the audience, if anybody has a question. Um, if you're still feeling shy, I also have a question. Has anybody got a question? Hands up. Okay, I'm, I'm kind of happy I get to ask another question then because panel of six is tough. Um, elephant in the room. We saw over the past year or so the uh, Just Energy Transition Partnership with the Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero funding roughly 20 million or 20 billion dollars even to Indonesia and 15 billion dollars to Vietnam. Um, roughly half is supposed to come from private financing, so really topical for this, um, for this group of people. 
Um, it's looking at things like the early retirement of coal assets and funding uh, moving towards renewable assets. So while much of the funding is agreed, really a lot of the details are, are still not agreed. Um, bankability of projects, like you said, still is a big question mark. Local content rules, guaranteeing future revenue streams. All of the problems we discussed today still exist and haven't been addressed. So it begs really the, the question, do you think it's going to be a success or is it, or is it a lot of noise? Um, Mr. Nguyen, can I start with you? Vietnam's in a really good position here, potentially. I mean, I wouldn't mind $15 billion or if you've any going spare. Um, what do you think? How do you even start to approach this? Where do you start to spend or allocate that kind of capital to? Okay, uh, first of all, uh, we share each other the same feeling and the same idea that uh, uh, to, uh, energy and transition is the uh, unchangeable uh, trend in global, and uh, uh, every country needs to, uh, to have the uh, suitable and effective policy to develop that trend and uh, to uh, make that trend to be uh, effectively in reality. Uh, I think it's not an uh, easy answer. Yep. Uh, um, the question that you just gave me that uh, do, uh, do I think that uh, uh, it is the Success. Uh, I think that uh, we cannot we cannot say that it will be successful or not right now because it takes time. Mm -hmm. We need time to uh, to see it uh, in reality. But at least uh, it's uh, one of the best way for uh, every country to approach uh, that financial resources. And you see that uh, until now the uh, state budgets of each country, uh, especially uh, including Vietnam, is a uh, uh, to develop the uh, uh, energy is uh, very difficult, uh, and now it uh, depends on uh, mostly uh, from the uh, international loan, uh, with uh, a very difficult and uh, complex uh, procedure, and the rate is uh, relatively high, and. Uh, uh, but the problem is that uh, until now, uh, the government uh, will not anymore guarantee for the uh, loan. Uh, so the approach uh, to uh, the commercial bank is uh, more and more difficult. So that's why um, uh, the um, uh, approaching the fund for climate change, uh, uh, approaching the uh, financial fund is uh, for for the uh, energy uh, transition is very important, especially so uh, for Vietnam. Uh, but uh, now, as I mentioned before uh, in the uh, second session, that uh, uh, to get the successful uh, energy um, transition, uh, Vietnam Vietnamese government needs the financial resources approximately, approximately uh, about 120 billion US dollars. And we, ourselves, can do about 15% of that. Okay. So I think most of the financial, financial uh, resources need from the international fund. So uh, that's why uh, approaching the uh, ZP is one of the best way. But uh, to get uh, the financial resources uh, from uh, international fund are facing uh, many, many difficulties, uh, uh, as uh, I can say following. The first Firstly, uh, it needs uh, to create the uh, legal framework. Uh, I share the same idea with uh, my colleagues there that uh, the foreign investor need a very long-term stable policy, mm -hmm. and it's what the government, including Vietnam, need to do. That we are trying to um, improve our legal framework, especially the incentive or uh, supporting policy for foreign investor. Uh, in this sector, but it can be stable for long term, uh, very transparent and predictable. Secondly, uh, we can make a monitoring agency to be independent role, and uh, um, and uh, very important to uh, create the uh, framework for uh, negotiation pricing. is very uh, very important as I mentioned before. Uh, and the third one is the uh, how to uh, create the, uh, the uh, electricity market with the uh, competitive price is very important to attract the foreign investors to uh, to come into this uh, very potential sector. 
And the last one is the uh, difficulties of, of uh, approaching the uh, uh, low rate uh, financial resources uh, because uh, the procedure for getting them is uh, very uh, complex. Okay. So uh, those are some uh, challenges and uh, difficulties that uh, as uh, at the side of uh, Vietnamese government is facing uh, when uh, trying to approach the uh, international financial resources. And uh, until now, uh, we are very happy because uh, Vietnam is the third country following uh, Indonesia and South Africa uh, to prove the uh, declare of uh, ZEPT. And uh, now, uh, Vietnamese government has uh, uh, set uh, uh, four groups to implement that. We have four groups, and uh, the head of the uh, national board is the, the prime minister. Mm -hmm. It means that the government is uh, very focusing on uh, uh, implementing successfully the ZEPT. Yeah. And uh, uh, that's some uh, practice and some idea that I can share from the history of Vietnam. Great. Thank you. So optimistic, lots of challenges still ahead. Um, well, the world is watching, so good luck. Um, I'm sure your neighbors in the Philippines, Brunei, Malaysia would be quite happy to do a, a similar deal, so watching with great intent. Um, if you could join me in thanking all of my panelists today, they've been fantastic. Um, appreciate all of your time. So David, thank you very much for the insightful and interesting discussion at this fourth panel discussion. Let's give a big round of applause once again for yes. the fourth panel discussion on renewable energy. Very fruitful indeed. And now I'd like to deliver our token of appreciation to all of the panelists and moderator. And for that, would like to invite Mr. Aris Indra Narto from the Investment Ministry of the Republic of Indonesia to deliver the mementos. So we'd like to distribute the mementos to Datuk Wira Arham Abdul Rahman, Chief Executive Officer, Malaysia Investment Development Authority, or MIDA. Mr. Nguyen Antoine, Deputy Director General of the Foreign Investment Agency, Minister of Planning and Investment of the Socialist Republic of Vietnam. Mr. Muhammad Firdaus Abdul Qadir, Senior Manager and Head of Facilitation and Coordination Office of FDI Action and Support Center, Brunei Economic Development Board. And also to Ms. Raquel Etchake, Director of Board of Investments of the Philippines.